I'm Mike Davis. I grew up in Southern California, actually the northern end of Southern California, Santa Barbara. My life changed totally when we moved to California and I, I learned to surf. You just pick your surfboard up, go to the beach and do it. It was just magic. And it was a dance. Instead of having to score, somebody wins, somebody loses, it was a dance. And it was character building. You, know, you get the snot beat out of you. It humbles you. you know, I'd always been pretty handy with my fists and stuff. You learn that when you're red hair, having to go to all these different schools. The surfing was cool. And I didn't realize it, that the place I grew up in Santa Barbara was the probably the most innovative hotbed for surfing manufacturer in California at the time. So I guess it was because we had Rincon as a test track, when you look back on it. And Rincon asks a lot of questions of a surfboard that Malibu doesn't. I mean, when did see Malibu, all those places ask different questions. But uh, Rincon seemed to ask them all. And to have a board, to be able to write it successfully, and to have a board that answered all those questions. Where you spend all your time swimming. And we just developed boards to ride that way from around the point indicator through every different bit of the point all the way down to the cove where it finished against the seawall. And that was the challenge. Tuck in your bloody shirt. If your shirt gets wrapped up in the planer, it'll eat you alive. And how do I know this? I've seen it happen two times to my good friend Bob Coop. Both of them in my factory. The thing is, the board is longer in the bottom because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And we did the down railers because everything started from the bottom. We started building the boards from the bottom first. First thing you do is cut it bevel off the corners to start the curve. Okay. To put the planer that does the cutting and give it the most cuts in the area that needs the most cuts. Oh, okay. This has been our rule for surfboards for 50 years. Mine for over so much, 60 years. It's four feet up from the tail, 48 inches there, here. Now that bit should be straight because your back foot is here, your front foot is here. When you lean forward, all you want to do is not push any curve into the water. So get rid of that bump. I bought my first surfboard from Radiator, and it was a Hobie. And I broke that board in half. I had it about six months, and I broke it in half surfing the carpentry up here. I thought my surfing career was done. My mother said, well, you broke your board. You're finished. And um, my best buddy Norman's father went, why don't you just build one? It's not rocket science. And we bought a bike. And Norman Grant and I built some racks in his garage and we built the first Grant surfboard. They actually started a surfboard business that we ran off through high school. This is called a torture board. There's the gopher, you kind of just, the guy that could, they give you the shitty sand jobs, like a big repairs on boats. Yeah. And they give you a big board with a piece of sandpaper on it and they go, now make this flush. Really good shaper, a lot of them were boat builders. <laughs> I was the sander, Norman was the shaper and glasser. And, um, yeah, it was good fun. It was some, I didn't think it would ever amount to anything, but it ended up being my life. It ended up being my whole life. These are just reference numbers, so that when I'm planing, I see kind of know straight away if I'm on course or off course. Okay, here's what those numbers mean. Four inches wide here. So you got the wide, just the widest bit, and then it tapers, or we just take more off all the way through. So it's four, seven, 10, 13, 16, 19, 22 just so you don't end up with a, a board that's got straight up like this or it's shaped all the way to the stringer. You start the planer where there's the most foam, which is 
here, okay? And then you're tapered to the ends. I'll show you. Uh, this band here, it'll come into there, not flat, but that's where it'll end. Then up the rail, we go to there, and this is the top horizon line. So he wants this to be a nose rider. I use a sanding block there because it doesn't chew the foam out around the stringers when you're trying to take that bit down. Line here, mm -hmm. horizon line. For the top horizon, what we do is just keep honing it. Big mofo! Oh. So I gotta take a lot more out of here, but just that big plane, I'll get rid of the shoulder on the rail, this bit. Mm. It's going to be on the board is this one right here. That's the final dot. To that one, this has been shaped down to here, down to here. That one. Oh. The early 70s until nearly the mid 70s were all S decks, which meant the thickest part of the board wasn't up under your chest where we were building the boards. What was the thickest part? Down the back. When I finish shaping the board, that's the only dot that's going to be left, okay? That's at the wide point. Mm -hmm. The way I shape, every dot disappears but that one. Get the switch over there, please. Understanding the physics of how things work, or understanding it, then you can actually knock the corners off or understand and label what you're working with. I was an academic. I was my dad was really an intelligent man, and I kind of schoolwork was really important to me. And I I loved reading. I used to eat books, just like just learn to read at an early age, and I read and read and read and read. I just absorbed stuff. So surfing was my escape from that. It was just so different. There was no, it was a different, a different discipline. But the thing is, the amount of detail and the attention to detail, I love keeping my boards in good condition because I knew that when they were smooth, they went through the water better and faster and stuff. So the academic thing kind of applied, gave me a language to describe what I was doing or understand what I was seeing. Derek Hind asked me about it once and I just looked at him and said, you just can't fuck education. We've taken some numbers before, we're going to take some numbers afterwards. The thing is, the more drag you put up in the front of the board, it trips you up while you're walking the nose. Because you're just putting that fat rail in the water, it just starts to slow you down. With this, you put it in the hard face, it only goes in so far, but it stops you from sliding and actually get on your inside rail and climb back up and hold your nose right longer. So the difference is, the ratio changes between here and the wide point where the hip is, which we started out at 49 and three quarter inches that was the circumference there. By the time we finished, we'll measure those whole things again and see what we got. Back, because once I've turned the rail, that, that'll change again too. I, it's this bit here. The wine has got it more right than anybody else because the waves are so challenging mm -hmm. and so steep. I was real keen on that. I loved the Hawaiian surfing. From the times I saw Paul Stroud when he showed up in 1962 or 63 at Rencon and watching the climbs and drops that he would do on a 10-foot day at Rencon and going, the speed he could achieve out of a late drop and had the redirection, he'd squirt out of the bottom, turn and climb back up again. It was like watching somebody from another planet because basically those boards that we were riding, you run down, you're going that fast, you've got to turn them, they're just going to take off and fly. They're going to flip out of the water. It was, the Hawaiians had something. And um, we were fortunate that Pat Kern would end up being a Santa Barbara guy who moved up from Laguna and worked for Yater. So the boards we started developing fit the wave better. Mm -hmm. We had the Hawaiian thing, the Hawaiian influence, and, and um, Pat Kern's design stuff was really, really um, mind-boggling at the time. The, the release edges and stuff. But we later, you know, added the short period. See, I'm connecting the dots. Dots. Dot there, 
dot there, dot there. Connect the dots. If you want to be here, yep. it keeps getting moved down to there. And see how it stays a taper all the way along there? Yep. You just slowly reduce that rail. It's like boxy. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, oh, yeah. it isn't. It's a blend. But the thing is, what you do is you get this rail to that, and then you bring the two together, and you'll end up with a bump right here, which you just blow off and it's gone. Yeah. A lot of guys want to keep going again, 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 again. It's much easier just to get this rail down to the contour you want where it goes in the water and it fits, and then bring the deck down to it. Deeper to it. Right. Yeah. Most important way of doing it. Yeah. We're getting close. I didn't think much there now. What does the fin do? And they go, oh, well, I ask them, what does the fin do? And they go, oh, it makes the board turn. I know, I know, I know it makes it possible for the board to turn. But if we had, the, this was a swimming pool, this room was a swimming pool. We took the fin out of your board and put it in the pool here. And I got the tail towards me, and you're at the other side of the pool, and I push it towards you, the board will go straight to you. I can turn it around so that the tail's towards you, no fin in it, and push it to you, it'll go straight to you. What that does is, it'll work that way. Then you put the fin in the board. And I've got the nose towards you and I push it towards you and it'll go straight to you. I turn the board around so that the fin's towards you and no matter how hard I push that board, the board spins around like that because all the drag is in the back. And that's why board surfboards work. You just gotta keep the back at the back. See what I'm doing? Yes. I will make you one of these. No, I will draw it on a piece of wood and you can make okay. it. Surfing's been such a big part of my life. My grandmother was a, was a full-blood Sioux. I have a kind of a different philosophy in a lot of things, and it wasn't about making money, or, or well, I didn't do things, and nothing ever, I didn't, couldn't do stuff. That wasn't enough motivation for me. It had to feel good. It had to make me happy. And surfing just made me absolutely blissfully happy. You know, there's all kinds of shit things can happen in the world. You can go for surf and forget about it for a while. And you have to forget about it when you're in the water because you either do it or it does you. And there's kind of an equalizer there that levels everything out and it cools, drops your body temperature, you know, gets rid of all that chatter you've got in your head and sorts you out. And when you come back on the beach, you pretty well, you know, got your act back together again. And, you know, it's, it's been a comfort to me for all those years. All my friends basically had surf. I had a few friends that didn't, of course, but uh, most of them have come from surfing. The one thing we've had in common, which is the environment that we live in, spending time in the water and not being poisoned by it or the air. But it was about getting through life happy. It was about raising your kids to be happy. You know, and, and to seeing the simple things in life. Because there's nothing much simpler than going down to the beach and jumping in the ocean with your board shorts. And I, you know, I've, I've met some wonderful, wonderful kids. I watched the, I'm really proud of some of what they've grown up to be in their lives. You know, it's, um, they could have gone anyway, and surfing kind of took them in that direction and put the focus in the right place, and they kept surfing in the right place. They didn't make it the most important thing in the world, of them, but they made it the thing that made it work for them. But I kind of went, you know, Kelly Slater plays golf for fun. I'd rather have surfing for fun. <laughs> that was just kind of my take on it. Guys crying They just see the tears roll down the street Just